Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship on this Sunday, the 17th of January. It's the first Sunday after Epiphany, and we had hoped we would all have been in church, uh, at least today, as we start a new series. But unfortunately, as you all know, on the 28th of December, and again on last Monday night, which was the 11th of January, uh, the President spoke and he gave us fresh regulations with regard to the COVID-19 crisis and the pandemic that all of us have experienced since March of 2020. And so we're still um, in a type of lockdown. Worship services are still too small, 50 people to be able to, uh, to handle. Uh, and with all the additional regulations, um, we are still here on the virtual service. Of course, there are many of our members who have not come in at all um, since uh, the uh, pandemic started because they have comorbidities or some are frail and this is our way of keeping in touch with all of you. Notwithstanding all of that, today we want to begin a new series and the series is really um, an attempt at a response uh, to the pandemic, to the situation we find ourselves in, to the loss of many lives, um, to the grief that many feel and to the sense of disorientation that is rife among our members. And so we're calling it Living Your Best Life. And I hope that in this series, which will be five or six Sundays long, you will find some sort of hope and consolation uh, to help us through this time. Listen to Chris Van Rooyen now as he reads from 1 Peter chapter 1. Good morning to each and every one of you. This morning's reading comes from 1 Peter 1, verses 1 to 9. And the reading continues as follows. I, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to God for a living hope. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of faith, the very salvation of your souls. And this ends the reading for this week, and we know that God always blesses the reading of his word. Amen. Living your best life. Well, we want to start we wanted to start off with a an important foundational principle and that is god's got your back do you remember the stories of peter from the new testament i remember the one about simon the fisherman who happened to bump into jesus along the sea of galilee's coast one morning when jesus used simon's boat to create an amphitheater so that he could preach to tell the crowd about God's kingdom. Luke says, in return, Simon got a great catch of fish that day, Luke chapter 5. Um, but Jesus gave him this prophecy, this calling, this vocation. Simon, from now on, you will catch men. 
I also remember the story of the same Simon Peter who was walking along with Jesus as the disciples traveled east, northeast, from Galilee to Caesarea Philippi. We call it Benice, the spring of the Jordan. As they walked, Jesus was making conversation with his disciples. Who do people say that I am? He said, according to Mark chapter 8. Well, there were the usual answers. Some say Elisha, some say the prophet, they said. But then he asked them straight, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter was the only one brave enough to say it out loud. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. In response, Jesus says to Simon, to Cephas in the Hebrew, you are Peter, Petros, and on this rock I will build my church. There are also some tough stories about Peter, the ones which are very hard to listen to. The worst was the time when Peter stood outside the place where Jesus was on trial. He was warming himself by a fire, like some of the rest of the, them were, and he denied knowing Jesus at the place Jesus needed him most. And then there was the braai, the awkward fish braai on the beach, where Jesus confronted Peter with his denial. Three times Jesus said, do you love me, Peter? And three times Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. It was there that Jesus gave Peter the insight into what his ministry would be like. Feed my sheep, said Jesus. Look after my lambs. It's the simple clue given to anyone who would enter his service about what the ministry will likely be all about. Finally, I remember the story of Pentecost Peter, the fisherman turned evangelist who strode out onto the balcony like the new pope after the conclave. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, he shouted, we are not drunk. It's only nine in the morning. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, in Acts chapter 2, verses 14, 15, and 36. But now, in this letter that was read for us this morning, it is not Cephas, but Petros, Peter who writes to the believers in Turkey. Now we know a lot about the one who writes the letter. You remember how stories about Peter and the meandering paths of life? But who are the people Peter is writing to? Are they anything like us? Do we have anything in common? Letters that were sent in the Greek and Roman world were written in a specific way. Not many people were literate and paper and ink were very expensive. So letter writing was infrequent and needed to be worthwhile. The author's name was put up right at the top, not like the rest of us who put our names at the end of a letter. Next came the identity of the person to whom or the people to whom the letter was addressed. In this case, there are peculiar references. Peter is writing to strangers in the world. He is writing to those scattered throughout Pontus and Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia. There is also reference to the elect and the chosen of God. Elizabeth Johnson in her commentary on this text writes, these people are at the very bottom of the social pyramid they inhabit. As slaves and women, they have low status to begin with because they violate the prime virtue of espousing the religious practices of the heads of their households, though their friends and neighbors and family members also consider them antisocial, rebellious, and even atheistic, since they refuse to honor their family gods. They defy traditional family values by refusing to obey the head of the household, and they jeopardize community welfare by insulting civic religion. Grecio Roman pagans, writes Elizabeth Johnson, can tolerate anything except intolerance. And Christians, and Jews too, it might be added, are seen as supremely intolerant. Why? Because they serve one God and no other. 
These Christians are really the forgotten ones. A minority in a Roman colony, paroikos in the Greek, which means a mixture, a mengelmus, pavement specials, a bit of this and a bit of that. But they were also the descendants of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 9, we hear that there was people from Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, the very place that Peter is writing to. Were they aliens or were they citizens? Well, I guess it depends on which kingdom you are asking about. Later, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 10, Peter would tell this mixed bag of people, and I quote, First, you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. It's got me thinking about the alternative world we in the church have often created. Barbara Brown Taylor sees it like this, I quote, In many ways, those who pursue ordination take the easy way out. They choose a prescribed role that seems to meet all the requirements and take up full-time residence in the church. They forego the hard work of straddling two different worlds, while those they serve have no such luxury. Those in the pulpit may know where they belong, but the people in the pews hold dual citizenship. When they come together as a church, that is where they belong, in God's country, which is governed by love. But when they leave that place, they cross the border into another country, governed by other less forgiving laws. And they live there too. One man I know, she writes, describes his dilemma in this way. On a Sunday morning, I walk into a world that is the way God meant it to be. Ooh, I wonder if they're describing us. People are considerate of one another. Strangers are welcomed. We pray for justice and peace. Our, our sins are forgiven. We all face one direction and we worship the same God. When it's over, I get into my car to drive home, feeling so full of love, it's unbelievable. But by the time I've gotten about 20 minutes down the road, it has already begun to wear off. By Monday morning, it's all gone, and I've got another whole week to wait until Sunday rolls around again. Barbara Brown Taylor observes, as the moat between the two worlds has widened, the old bridges have become obsolete, leaving committees to paddle across by themselves the best way they can. So we're suffering. The cause is COVID-19. We all have different views about how best to handle it. Some have had it and survived, and so they are emboldened to soldier on. Some have lost loved ones, and they bear the scars and the confusion, not knowing which way to turn next. Some are paralyzed by fear. Why wouldn't they be? Some lash out at the government, at the international health bodies, well, at anybody really. Some refuse to wear a mask. Some wear their mask, but only begrudgingly. Some wear a mask like a statement, a symbol of arrogant compassion. And others do it because that's what they're told to do. We suffer. Some as a consequence, and others despite their best efforts to pretend otherwise. We are different. Remember, a mixed bag, a mengel mus. First, you were not a people, writes Peter. Suffering, hurting deeply, mixed bag, mixed up, scattered by the rules of social distance, feeling less and less at home in our own lands, Americans realizing for the first time that they really are the third world, like the rest of us, British and Europeans who now see that they can't isolate themselves against every hardship, and we here in Africa fighting among ourselves as usual, and complaining that yet again we stand at the end of a long shopping queue for vaccines, with coins 
while others swipe the plastic, waiting for the shop-soiled vaccines, which are cheaper. In this beautiful passage, Peter, not Cephas, Peter who was baptized in Jesus and changed his name, Peter who knows what it is to be down and out, Peter who has been up and down, but Peter who knows how empowering forgiveness is, addresses God's scattered children. He reminds us that we are God's children now. We have been born again, and what we were born into is a living hope. Verse 3. Basically, Peter is reframing our story. He is encouraging us to not look only at the immediate, but also to look above and beyond and underneath our suffering and misery. He is giving us hope, but hope which is based on truth. Peter is pointing out what God is doing. A new birth, a fresh start. This is what Jesus tried to tell Nicodemus as he came by night to have the gospel made simple for himself. Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again or born from above. The Greek word ana, either above or again. John chapter 3. If you can give that thought a go, if you can explore that image a little bit, says Peter, it will give you a living hope and an inheritance. Now just stop there for a moment. Inheritance was an unknown concept for women and slaves and the poor, the audience of this letter. Firstly, there was nothing to inherit, nothing to leave behind, no money, living hand to mouth, just making each day go by. Even if there was something to inherit, they were not allowed to inherit. Non-Roman citizens, women, even of means, slaves and the poor did not have the right to inherit anything. The only purpose of this line then from Peter could have been to tantalize or to empower his listeners. God is going to give you, slave or poor that you are, an inheritance. And the inheritance is going to be protection. See verse 4. Shielded by God's power, says Peter. Also, you will inherit something else. Eternal life. There is continuity in God's love for you. You can also leave this in witness to your children. God's love can be passed on from one generation to another. At last, there is some honor and dignity for you who didn't inherit before, and there's a sense of belonging. First, you were not a people, says Peter in chapter 2 and verse 10, but now you are the people of God. Can you see what God did for those early Christians? Can you see what God has done for us? Can you see that if all this is true, if you really believe, you can start living your best life? It is not surprising then that Peter calls upon the Christian community, aliens and scatterlings though they be, to rejoice in the midst of suffering. Joy can come welling up within you despite the circumstances. I have felt amazing joy at different times in these last few weeks as our family has gone through difficult times. Joy can be a response to love. It can be a response to authenticity, to examples of compassion. You can feel a pride when someone does something that they really should not be able to do. Rejoice within suffering. And then Peter also counsels the Christians in this context to that they, their faith can be proved genuine. Faith is tested in suffering, and as fire refines precious metals like gold, and as our faith, having been tested, can be proven genuine. True friends of Jesus are not merely fine-weathered friends. They are true friends when their trust in Him has survived challenge and hardship. The wisest among us are not those who have had it easy, but those who have been through difficult times, who have had their fair share of arguments with God, but who have hung on to His hand in times of trouble. 
Though he slay me, says Job, after all that trouble, still I will trust in him. And most beautifully Habakkuk the prophet wrote, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there be no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will be joyful in God my Saviour. Peter reminds us that God is in control and that the world on the other side of the veil is God's kingdom, that God offers us a second chance, a new birth, and a living hope, an inheritance, and ultimately the greatest of all gifts, as he puts it, the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. So what should we do, you and I, living here in these COVID pandemic times? How are we to react to this reorientation, to this reframing of our situation? We who are Christian scatterlings, or maybe even the Christian scatterlings of the early church who first received this letter, we a mingle mus of people and cultures of the 21st century. We can take heart from Peter's words of encouragement. This same Peter who had to be encouraged himself many times. The Peter who knew sin and failure, but who also knew words of affirmation and words of forgiveness from the mouth of Jesus himself. We must live in hope. We are God's people. He will give us the shelter of his protection. God is still here, working behind the scenes, above and on the other side of history, to work all things together for the good of those who love him. We can't stand still. We must move forward, cautiously, but determinedly, to do his will. Barbara Brown Taylor reminds us, our worship tells us the household of God was not meant to stay in the house. The gospel we hear proclaimed week after week is God's good news about the redemption of the world in which we are invited to be a part. Our prayers are prayers for the church and for the world. We confess our sins against God and our neighbors, and we do not mean just those sitting beside us in the pew. The two great sacraments of the church, baptism and Holy Communion, remind us that we are sent the prayer goes, send them into the world in witness to our love. We pray for those about to be baptized. Send us now into the world in peace. We pray for ourselves in the communion service. There is simply no getting around it. If the church is where we learn who and whose we are, then the world is where we are caught, called to put our knowledge into practice. We will need to embrace the world, the true earth and all God's people, if we would be instruments of his grace and will have to learn to change. So friends, from now and into these next weeks, let's try living our best life. Social distanced, locked down as we are, let's try learning to live our best life. After all, God has our back. Amen.